And we are in the book of Isaiah this morning. So turn there with me. Uh, there are Bibles in the back. We have been studying through the book of Isaiah. I've taken a couple of breaks now. And now we are looking at chapters 60 through 62. We want to wrap up this book in the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, September 11th, as we do our building expansion, we are going to do a two-part, two or three-part series on disciple making. That's what Jesus commanded. He said, I'll build my church. You go make disciples. Um, so we're going to be doing that in September. And then at the end of September, beginning of October, we're going to jump into the gospel according to Luke uh, is where our next study. We go through book, book studies here at King's Chapel, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So you're going to need your Bibles open, your Bible app open as we look at uh, just a couple of chapters here. We're going to hit them as we did last week um, and uh, bring some application, I hope. And then um, so you just have to have your Bible. Not all the verses are up there. So chapter 60 through chapter 62 is where we are. So open your Bibles again, your Bible apps. We did a real, a real long recap last week of the book of Isaiah, so I'm not going to do that again today. It's just a short one, just to remind you that there are three sections in Isaiah. Chapters 1 through chapters 39 is the first major section. God's warned his people of the covenant breaking sins of, 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 of pride and fear of man, abusive leadership, oppression, and, and we saw King Ahaz. Uh, made a foolish and ungodly uh, alliance with, with foreign nations because they, the, man, uh, the Israelites were more afraid of what people can do than they were of the Lord. And we said that verse 30, chapter 39, at the end of the first section, ended with the northern kingdom Israel destroyed and decimated. The Assyrian army had marched in and destroyed them, and now they're on the, on the doorstep of Judah, the southern kingdom, in the city of Jerusalem, northern and southern kingdoms. And at the end of the first section, God's people... <laughs> We're still waiting for that king to come, Isaiah 9, the, the promised king. And we saw that his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Of the increase of his government and the peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David, the king of kings, on the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. And, and God's people were just yearning for a better king when chapter 39 concludes. The second major section is chapter 40 through 55. Isaiah is writing in the 8th century, but he's writing to a people in the 6th century that went into exile. Remember? God said, listen, you're going into exile. Chapter 39, you're going into exile. And they were. And God raised up Isaiah to see the future and writes now as the people are in exile. He wants to comfort them. That's what chapters 40 through 55 is all about. To comfort them, to remind them that God is going to deliver them from Babylon. He's not going to leave them in exile forever. Jeremiah says it's going to be for 70 years. And God promised in that section that he'll raise up a servant, actually a Messiah, an anointed one called Cyrus, the king of Persia. And that was really just, a, just pointing to the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate anointed one, the ultimate servant of the Lord, who is Jesus Christ, who became our atoning sacrifice. He suffered as our substitute, dying on the cross for our sins. We saw that in the suffering servant in chapter 53. He was pierced as Jesus for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the Lord laid on him what deserve, we deserve laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we have the, the greater and better king, chapters 1 through 39, and, and 40 through 55, the greater and better servant Messiah, Jesus. Chapter 55 ended with a glorious invitation to come to the banquet of Christ. For everyone everywhere to come, thirsty and hungry souls, all people, the rich, the poor, to come to the banquet of Christ. And then last week we began this last section, 55 through 66, 56 through 66. The Israelites had returned from exile. Again, he's writing in the 8th century Isaiah, but looking forward as God gave him revelation. And he is writing to a people that has returned from exile. We're not sure the exact date, but one thing we are sure of as we read these chapters, 55 through 56, uh, 66, is that God continues, it's very important, to pour out his grace on an undeserved people who cannot earn their salvation by their good works and cannot receive righteousness all by themselves. It ends with chapter 66, we'll see that on September 4th, with the new heavens and the new earth, the promise of God culminating in, in the renewed earth. Same promise we see in Revelation 21. But last week, if you remember, as we began this last section, we saw that Isaiah was talking about what it looked like for the redeemed to live 
what it looked like for the foreigners to live as grace-filled people. They were to keep justice and do what is right. They were to hold fast to the covenant promises of God. And although Isaiah revealed the sinfulness of God's people, remember last week we said they were not only hypocrites, but they were idolatrous. They were chasing after other things. God amazingly still keeps his promise to his people if they would humble himself themselves. He would revive the people who have a contrite and lowly heart. And then in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah says that the Lord's hand is not too short to save, but it's been our sin. It's our sin that separates us from our God. Our sin uh, is so that he does not hear our prayer. That's a problem. But then in chapter 59, verse 16, again, the, the grace of God. Chapter 59, verse 16, we read this. He saw, that God saw, that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation and his righteousness upheld him. God saw the problem that we're in. God tells us that our sin separates us from him. And then God gives us the remedy and his name is Jesus. That's the grace of God. And we see this picture of Jesus being even more beautiful and marvelous in the following verses, 17 through 21. A beautiful picture of the, of, the, of the work and the person of the Messiah, the Christ. That's why the series is called The Gospel According to Isaiah, because Isaiah keeps showing us how sinful and broken we are, how holy and gorgeous and beautiful he is, and how much we need him, and how he steps in and intervenes. And chapter 59 concludes with the promised vengeance of the Messiah, verse 18. And that same Messiah, verse 19 through 21 of chapter 59, will redeem us through the new covenant in his blood. He promised to put his spirit upon us and the word in our mouth. And now Isaiah picks up in chapter 60. And we'll see this beautiful description of God's city and the one who turns it from sinful, brokenness, rebellion people to a glorious delight and joy. So the glory of God in Zion, chapter 60. The anointed one of good news, chapter 61. And the city of God's delight, chapter 62. So turn in your Bibles, please. The good news about these chapters, I think, at least from what I see, is the first few chapter, real, the first few verses, excuse me, really lay out and capture... The entire chapter. So we'll look at the first few verses mainly, but keep your Bibles open. So chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. Let me, let me read verses 1 through 3 first. Hear the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But... The Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Isaiah the prophet, who lived in Jerusalem, I saw the coming of the sunshine rising from the east in Jerusalem many times, I'm sure. First coming over the Mount of Olives to the east and falling on the city. And as one looks out, as the light begins to shine, driving the darkness away, gloriously revealing the walls of Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem, the domes, the towers, and the homes of Jerusalem. The, the finite glory of God's rising sun can be still seen today in Jerusalem. But here Isaiah is speaking of a more infinitely glorious rising. In a vision, Isaiah sees the Lord himself rising over Zion like a sun, filling the whole city with his glory. And he calls God's people to arise. A powerful word. Peter used it when he commanded Tabitha to rise in chapter 9, verse 40, from the dead. Arise. There's no question who Isaiah is speaking about. This is not simply the Shekinah glory, the presence of God in the temple, but the coming of the glorious one, the suffering servant Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life shall come. In Isaiah 42, 
It says that God the Father made his son to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. That he would, uh, uh, that the blind eyes would be openers and prisoners would be released from dungeons, from the dungeons of sin. Jesus doesn't just merely shine his light, merely open the eyes to physical daylight. He's the light of the world by which our souls are illuminated. And the only way we can see the beauty of God, the only way we can see our salvation is if Christ opens our eyes. If the spirit of God opens and illuminates us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul said this, that the God, small g, of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So, family, it, folks, if you're, if you're here today and you have not seen the glory of Christ, if you've not seen your need for salvation, if you've not turned from your sin and ran to Jesus for salvation, the Bible says part of that is because the God of this world, the enemy of this world, has blinded your eyes to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. Of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. Well, how? He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The, the glory of God, the infinite worth, the incalculable value and worthy praise of our God comes to us in the person and the work of Jesus. And it will come again in his glorious return. And Isaiah summons the nations to rise up and shine because the light had arrived. Way back in chapter 49, God the Father says, I will make you my servant, the Messiah, as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. At that time, God's brilliant appearing, the earth and all the people, it says, will be covered in darkness, spiritual blindness, moral evil, there'll be hopelessness. But the appearance of the glory of God will remove the cover of blindness that covers the earth because his glory will be seen in his full brilliance. And family, we are in a dark place. When we call evil good and good evil, we are in a dark place. But Jesus will come. And Jesus has come. Part of this, we, we get a glimpse of this even in the, in the first advent, the first coming of Christ, when he said, this is judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They loved darkness. But Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. And the purpose of sharing his glory, the purpose of the coming salvation for his people becomes explicit in verse 3. Israel has a mission. Verse 3, the nation shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. As the light is rising, as salvation is being proclaimed, nations will come flowing to Zion. And notice it's, never, it's, it's not simply for them, it's for the world. Even kings will be attracted to the brightness of Israel's rising. Some of you may have heard of Ray Steadman. He's an old-time preacher. Passed away, went to be with Jesus, Ray Steadman. He writes this. God's glory had once dwelt only to depart because of Israel's sin. God's glory then came into the temple. But it departed when the nation turned to idols. The glory came to Israel in the person of Jesus, but the nation nailed that glory to a cross. Today, God's glory dwells in his church and in his people. But one day, his glory will be revealed to the earth when he answers his people's prayer, thy kingdom come, end quote. Now, I believe, we've talked about this before, the ultimate fulfillment of this passage and some of these passages will be in the literal millennial reign of Christ on earth. I know some of you don't want to hear that. That's okay. But it does have application for the church today. The church is supposed to be what? Light and salt to the world. Right? You are the light of the world, Jesus is telling us. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said the church has a responsibility. That when, but, but when the Lord is crucified and buried and rises again, if we, if we lift up the name of Jesus after the atonement, the responsibility of the church, he said, I will draw all people to myself. And the, and the joy, verse 5, of verse 5, look what it says. 
Then you shall see and be radiant. You see the salvation. You see the glory of God. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Luke when Jesus said, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. By the way, there are none. Zion will look up and see the flooding of the nations, the glory of God, and the elect coming to Zion, and the heart of Zion uh, will, will tremble with joy as the good news of the gospel spreads. And, and in particular, verse 6, this spectacular diversity, look at verse 6, of cultural patterns of worship, nations will bring through the gates of Zion. You see this celebration of people coming from all over to the temple, to the place of God. Again, I think this situation is in germ form when Christ first came, but will be fulfilled in the literal reign of Christ on earth. Now, some of you are on millennial position. I respect that, which you mean. I have Chris's raised his hand in the back. Pastor Chris, that's okay. We disagree, but we love each other and we serve together. So that should tell you something about King's Chapel. It's good. As long as Jesus comes back in the wind, we're all good, Right? But they would say that this passage really is uh, either for the church age, which is during the millennial reign is right now, and that the coming and the entering into the, 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 the worship of God of all nations will be in the final reign of Christ. That's cool. I believe it's a millennial reign when Christ will come and reign for a thousand years and bring his people back to Zion for a thousand years and then bring in and usher into his eternal kingdom. The good news is, whether you're an amill or you're a pre-mill position, both interpret that we, the church, have a mission, the Missio Dei. That we are to demonstrate and declare the gospel, uh, telling others about Jesus. We're called to be light. We're called to be salt in this dark world. We're called to, to tell others and call all people to repent and believe on Jesus. We are ambassadors. We are messengers of Christ, calling everyone everywhere to believe, to repent and believe the gospel. And we rejoice with the angels in heaven over one repentant sinner who placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news also that both interpretations, amil and premil, believe in the final glorious renewal of all things. When every nation, every tongue, every tribe will come and worship the Lord. And on those, it's on those two things that we join together. We find common ground proclaiming the gospel. All of which is possible because of God's son, servant, Messiah, the king of kings. And God has revealed his glory in his son. And we are to reflect his glory, his infinite value, incalculable worth, the person and work of Christ for all his, for his glory and our joy as we declare the gospel. Do you believe that's what your mission is? Again, Jesus said, I will build my church, you go make disciples. We, make, we glorify God by making disciples. That's, that's our mission statement. Through gospel-centered worship, transformation, and community. That's why we exist. And the rest of verse, uh, chapter 60, speaks about the nations who will serve Israel. Chapters 10, uh, verse 10 through 16, the Gentiles will come to Israel because of who our God is, will submit to Israel because of what the Lord has done. They will serve with, with Israel. The Gentiles will. And look at verse 10. I love verse 10. Foreigners shall build up your walls, as Gentiles, non-Jews, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you. That's, that's a discipline of the Lord on his people. But in my favor I had mercy on you. Now, God tells the foreign nations, the ones that he used to discipline his people, then he judged that, you know what, times are going to change for you with the gospel. You're going to serve me. You're going to minister to my people. And he says to his own people, listen, you deserve chastisement and my anger and wrath, but now I'm going to have mercy and favor on you because of the Messiah, the salvation of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, gates will be open. Wealth will be brought in. Other nation kings will serve them. Look down at verse 18. Even violence will be no more. Destruction will end. The walls will be called salvation. And then in verse 19, Isaiah is seeing all this, I believe, again, in the millennial reign of Christ. And then looks forward to the final restoration of all things in verse 19. Then the sun shall be no more. Your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light. And your God will be your glory. You know, in our present day, the sun sets and light evaporates and the moon has its own beam. But the glory of the Lord will never set or wane. The new Jerusalem will be radiant with God's glory at every single moment. 
when the glory of the Lord appears. We end this chapter in verses 21 and 22a. It really speaks of four glorious truths. Four glorious truths as the glory of the Lord rises on Zion. Look at them with me really quickly. Number one, they're all righteous. See that? They're all righteous. Not their righteousness. Verse 21 is his righteousness, number one. Number two, they are assured their permanency. Look what it says. They shall possess the land forever. They'll be righteous. They'll be uh, permanency. They'll be established by God for his beauty and for his glory, that I might be glorified. And finally, their influence will be out of, out of proportion to their size. Look what it says. And the smallest one, an almighty nation, I am the Lord. In his time, I will hasten it. You see that? He cements the reality of what God's going to do when he says, I am the Lord. In its time, I will. Not maybe. I'll think about it. Let's see how, you know, the human will and, and everybody's, you know, uh, decisions will be. Everybody, no, I will hasten it. So let me, let, me, let me ask this question as we go to part two here. Does the promises of God... Bring joy and gladness and worship to your soul. Does the promises of eternity and what God's going to do bring joy and gladness and worship to your soul? You may be in a dark place this morning. I don't know. You may be facing opposition. You may be facing a crippling situation. I mean, we got the return of the exiles going back to a Jerusalem that has been destroyed. But if you are a child of God through the gospel, the final and ultimate fulfillment of all God's promises will come to pass. He's the sovereign Lord, the almighty God, the holy one of Israel who said, I will hasten it. We can have hope. Meditating on the, uh, uh, intently on, on the coming glory of Zion and all that God had promised and continues to promise. The, gli- the glory of Zion. Next, the anointed one of good news. Chapter 60. Describes Zion's exaltation, chapter 61, speaks about the one that's going to do it. That's what chapter 61 is all about. Who's going to accomplish it? Again, the first few verses, chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Verse 1. So before God appears in his glory, he's going to what? Bring salvation for all the people through the anointed one who will bring good news, who will bring freedom, grace, God's comfort, God's gladness. And what's so interesting about this is Isaiah in chapter 53 had the privilege of of piercing in and seeing in advance the work of Jesus on the cross and the atoning sacrifice in chapter 53. Now he gets to see the special privilege And to hear the Messiah announce his work of salvation. Jesus has already been described as the one with the spirit. Remember? Chapter 11. Coming from the shoot and branch of Jesse. Who will have the spirit of the Lord resting on him. God said that Jesus, the servant, in chapter 42. He said, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delight. I have put my spirit upon him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I was reading this week, sometimes the Old Testament commentators and, and scholars, uh, I think they read too much of the Old Testament. Not that you can read too much of the Old Testament, but they're, 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 they're going back and forth saying, you know, who is this really pointing to? I'm like, look, look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Jesus goes to Nazareth, comes home. Word about, it's, it's a year of popularity, they call it. Word about all he's doing in all the regions, especially in uh, Capernaum, which is near there. His teaching, his miracles, all, everyone's talking about it. And all, the, all this buzz got to Nazareth. And now Jesus is in Nazareth. There's a, there's a buzz in the city. It's the Sabbath day. It's Saturday. You know what they do on the Sabbath day and Saturday? They go to church. We don't need a church. Well, tell that to Jesus. He went to church. He went to the Sabbath, gathered in the synagogue. Jesus stood and a scroll was given to him. Okay, we heard about you. The prophet from Nazareth. Here, here's the scroll. Jesus takes a scroll, which is rolled up in those days. You don't have a book. 
unrolls it right to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2a. And reads that verse to everyone. It was customary then, you would roll up the scrolls, sit down and teach. So he rolls the scroll back up, sits down to teach. Everybody's listening. Could hear a pin drop, I'm sure. And Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Pretty clear what he's about to say. Seven centuries before Jesus reads this passage, Isaiah writes about it. And Jesus says that day, I'm the one Isaiah spoke about. I'm the ultimate anointed one. Again, the word anointed is the Hebrew word where we get Messiah. Greek uh, word is where we get the word Christ. They would anoint the priest. They would put oil. That's what it literally means to oil, to rub on the priest and the, and the kings. This is kind of an outward sign of what they hoped God would do, and that would be to anoint them with the Holy Spirit, right? You could rub oil on someone's forehead, but you can't give them the Holy Spirit. Only God does that. It was a sign that God would pour out his Holy Spirit on that person. And here we have the ultimate anointed one. And notice in this text in chapter 61, same thing in, in, um, in when, when Jesus was baptized. You have all work, the work of the Trinity. You have the Spirit of the Lord coming down on Jesus as a dove, on the Son. The Spirit coming down on the Son. And you have the Father speaking. It's in Matthew. And here we have, look, look at this text here. God the Father is, is, is the anointing one. God the Son is the anointed. And God the Spirit is the anointing. You have the work of the Trinity. Notice here, too, that Jesus is not only the proclaimer of good news, but he is the good news. I, I, the, the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And, and interesting, the word poor doesn't mean economically poor. Well, I, I've got a lot of money. I guess he didn't come to me. That's not what it means. The word poor has to do with uh, um, weighing down, having troubles, uh, you know, uh, broken, maybe broken over sin, broken over guilt. God has good news for you this morning. God has good news for you if you are poor in spirit. If you're struggling with guilt. If you're struggling with things you've done and said and acted and is plaguing your life. Jesus has come for you to preach the gospel, the good news. He sent me, that's the mission, to bind the brokenhearted. Not only preach the good news, but to bind the brokenhearted. That, that, that's a picture of someone who is being bandaged. Someone who is hurting, someone who needs healing, someone who has maybe been, been hurt, we would say, by guilt and rejection. Aren't you glad Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted? Aren't you glad Jesus came to heal the guilty and the rejected one? Aren't you glad he came to heal the broken who by grief or by sorrow or by affliction, Jesus come to heal the brokenhearted? Some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you need to hear they came to proclaim liberty to the captives, one in bondage. Maybe you're in bondage this morning. Maybe the cycle in your life it just seems to not be broken in your life. Maybe you're a prisoner, he says here next. Bound to, to a place and you can't be set free. Think about the ministry of Jesus. Think about how he set people free from demonic oppression and brought comfort to those who were hurting. Like the man who was naked in Mark 5 in the city of uh, Gerasene who had demons living among the tombs. His name was Legion because there were a lot of demons in him. And Jesus commands the demons to leave and go rushing into the pigs and over the hill they go. Or think of the, the love and, and compassion that Jesus had to Mary and Martha in John 11 at the tomb of their brother, Lazarus, who was dead. When, when he, and, he, and he took these two ladies from their grief and sorrow and through kindness and mercy and truth and, and brought them to a place, a level of faith that they have never been before, trusting in the resurrection of Christ, who is the resurrection. Isaiah continues to portray Christ, verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. In the Old Testament, God has established what's called the year of jubilation. Some of you have heard that before. Leviticus 25. Every 50th year, the Israelites were to cancel all the debts. They were to return to its original owners all property that had been sold. The priest 
would blow a trumpet, the prop, uh, proclaim liberty throughout the land. And what Isaiah is saying is that someday that foreshadow will be, become real when Christ, the true liberator, will come. Isaiah is saying that the Messiah brings liberation to the fullest extent in the gospel. The cross cancels all our sin debts. We are free to leave the past behind and walk in our new identity in Christ. A worldwide mission. An era of grace. Debts of sin can be canceled. Prisoners that, are, that have been bound to sin, to Satan, to death can be set free to worship our God. But notice this passage. Remember I said that he read chapter 61, verses 1 through 2a. If you look at Luke 4, Jesus did not read that second part of chapter 2. He did not say, and the vengeance, and the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped short. Why? It's not been fulfilled yet. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. He will. When Christ returns, he will. When, 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 when Revelation 19 talks about the wicked will be slain, the coming judgment will come. But Jesus is saying, no, no, I'm here to save. I'm here to rescue. I'm here to redeem. I'm here to forgive. And the warning that's here, and Isaiah mentioned this warning, is important. It's not that it's not important, but Jesus wasn't there to fulfill that at the moment. He will. And this warning is for you today and for me today. The warning that a time will come when Jesus Christ will return with vengeance. We'll look at that more next week. Things will not go on as they are forever. No matter what people tell you, no matter what the news might tell you. One day God will bring them everything to a sudden end. And we shouldn't take that lightly. Maybe you're here this morning and you keep coming back and you keep coming back. And we're glad you're here. We want you to keep coming back. But today's the day of salvation. But tomorrow's not guaranteed. Don't put off responding to the spirit of God's prompting to repent and believe in the gospel. We'll circle back to that. Verse 3. More what the work of the Messiah, the Christ, is going to do. To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be, what, glorified. See what the Messiah is going to do. He, he's come to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn, and then to grant. That verb, to grant, points to the decision of God, something he will provide. And then the next one he says, not only to grant, but to give them a beautiful headdress. He's not only going to make that decision, he's going to provide that headdress for us. That, that repentant mourners will, will be gifted with a beautiful head covering instead of ashes. They would put ashes on your head when, when, you had, when you would mourn uh, as a sign of mourning. He said, no, 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 we'll give you a headdress. And then oil. A lot of times they would put oil on as they rejoice. It was a, a sign of rejoicing. He said, there's going to be a garment of praise. There's going to be oil poured on you. Not, not, the, not the faint spirit. Not the one that is crushed. Can't move. No. Oil of gladness instead of mourning. Garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Praise God for that. In verses 4 through 9, Isaiah speaks of the effects of the mission. God's people will rebuild. Repair the city that was devastated. Gentiles, verse 5, will come and serve the Israelites. We've seen this before. Verse 6, again, I believe in the millennial reign of Christ. The Israelites will be called priests. Verse 7, shame shall be replaced with a double portion. We see all this happening because God intervenes with the Messiah. Notice verse 8, the promise of the eternal covenant. How could God promise eternal covenant? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament covenant and now has brought a new covenant by his blood. Not written on stone, but written on the human heart. And now the only thing left to do, since the Messiah, who is the good news, comes with good news, the cities are rebuilt, the everlasting covenant and his blessings are poured out, the recipients in Zion rejoice, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. Right? We have none. He done it. 
as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Isn't thanksgiving, isn't worship and praise the natural response to grace? How many songs do you think were written and that we sing, written by someone who came suddenly to the overwhelming reception of the grace of God? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, John Newton. English slave trader, trafficking captive Africans to the West Indies, who then came to faith and just couldn't believe the amazing grace that was given to him. Charles Wesley tasted of the grace of God and wrote this hymn, I think, like a couple of days after he came to, came to faith. He wrote this, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me who... Who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God should die for me? Both these songs written by men who came face to face. The amazing grace of God. Poured out. On us. Through the Redeemer. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. The Messiah's mission is to seek and to save the lost. And the clearest evidence of receiving that grace. Is the evidence of praise and worship of our God. What other response could there be for the amazing grace of God, right? The ashes of disgrace on us, we, were, we earned our rebellion and pride and selfishness. We deserve his wrath, but in God's richness and kindness and mercy and love toward us, he's given us a crown, oil, garments, and taken away chains and our filthy garments. Amazing grace. And finally, we see the city of God's delight. Verse six, uh, chapter 62, another beautiful portion of scripture declaring our new heart, declaring all that God thinks and feels about his people. This chapter is the preparation of the city of Zion. The preparation of the city of Zion. We saw chapter 60, what it's going to look like. Here's the prep. Here's what's going to happen. Look at verses 1 through 5 with me. Chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name. And the mouth of the Lord will give you. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her. And your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as young men marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, look at the last part of verse 5, so shall your God rejoice over you. Okay? When we talk about rejoicing over the city, God is not mainly talking about the bricks and mortar, right? He's talking about the people of the city. And, and, and uh, again, although I think the immediate context is the restoration of Zion and the millennial reign of Christ, there's so much in the New Testament that speaks this way concerning God's people, including when God brings the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21. That's why Paul, no wonder Paul made a special prayer that somehow the church, you and I, would, would comprehend the great love of God in Ephesians. He says that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge? It's like almost as if you can't even wrap your head around it. But imagine if we did. Brothers and sisters, imagine this morning that we wrapped our heads a little bit more around this text. This imagery. There are a lot of other images in scripture, but we're talking about this one today. We have a tendency to see God as a harsh God, a God of anger and wrath, and, and he is. He's not harsh, but he has an anger and he has a wrath. But he's a God of comfort and a God of love and a God of grace. And we've got to wrap our head around those thoughts and, 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 and understand as children of God, as blood-bought children of God, he delights over you. Have you thought about that? Yesterday marked my 35th anniversary coming to to faith, that Jesus rescued me 
I remember reading Psalm 18. It said that he, he took me from on high because, and he rescued me because he delighted in me. And I thought, I never thought of God delighting in me through Jesus Christ before. Maybe you haven't either. He delights in you. A few months ago, I read a book while I was on sabbatical called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dan Ortland. I know the ladies did a study on it. And the premise of the book is that Jesus' heart is gentle and lowly. Okay, you see, yeah, I knew that. But it's even more gentle and more lowly for those who blow it. That's the premise of the book. Sometimes we tend to think that Jesus is gentle and lowly and kind toward me when I'm doing the right thing and I'm going to church and I'm praying and I'm giving and I'm, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Jesus' heart is lowly and gentle. No, actually, Jesus' heart is lowly and gentle when we fall flat on our face. He writes this in his book. The cum uh, cumulative testimony... The cumulative testimony of the four Gospels is that when Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of the world all around him, his deepest impulse, his most natural instinct is to move toward the sinner and suffering, not away from it. In order for you to fall short of loving embrace, in order for you to fall short of loving embrace into the heart of Christ, both now and into eternity, Christ himself would have to be pulled down out of heaven and put back in the grave, end quote. It's a great book. Here in his text, we're reminded of the tender love and joyful commitment of God as he cares for his bride. The Bible talks about the, us being the bride of Christ. Verses 1 through 2 declares the zeal of the city for his people. He will not rest until she's shining with righteousness. Right? You don't have to look any further than the book of Isaiah. The righteousness he's talking about is not their own. It's, it's his. And salvation burns like a torch, he says, because of the righteousness that God has given to his redeemed people by grace. And then their righteousness and the glory will be seen by nations and kings. And they'll have a new name. Notice that. The sovereign Lord gives righteousness and gives transformation and gives them a new name. We see that in Revelations too. God's people receive a, good na a new name. It's indicative of a new character in a relationship with God. He does it with Peter. Petros. Simon. All this through the work of the Messiah. Verse 3. The Lord will make Jerusalem as a beautiful crown fit for a king. He will hold it securely in his hand. What's expensive and, and unique and guarded and precious. A royal prestige God has in his hand. Then it's out with the old and in with the new. Verse 4. You shall not be termed forsaken anymore. That word speaks of their forsakenness. When they sinned against God and, and God just gave them up to the enemy. You will not no more be termed forsaken or desolate. We've seen that before as we studied in this book. That the enemies of God came in and destroyed the cities, burned it to the ground. That's not going to be your name anymore. God will give you an appropriate name of completeness and restoration. My delight is in her. Translation of a Hebrew name in 2 Kings. Pointing to God's pleasure. Restored pleasure in his relationship with Zion. Your land married. What does that have to do with being a possession of God? You're not going to be unwanted. You're not going to be uncared for. You're, you're going to be cared for as a bride, as a, as a groom takes care of his bride. That's what he's saying. Do you realize that the beauty and glory and security of the new heavens and the new earth isn't all that great unless the one who's delighting over us is present? And we can talk about the streets of gold. We can talk about seeing friends from the past. But the delight and joy of the Lord will be our possession. That's amazing. Zephaniah 317 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save. He rejoices over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. Family, listen to that again. God will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Have you thought about that? John Piper in his book, The Pleasures of God, he says this. The greatest joy is joy in God. That's plain from Psalm 16. You, God, will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And then he writes, fullness of joy and eternal joy cannot be improved. 
Fullness of joy and eternal joy cannot be improved. Nothing is fuller than full and nothing is longer than eternal. And this joy is owing to the presence of God, not the accomplishment of man. Therefore, if God wants to love us infinitely and delight us fully and eternally, he must preserve for us the one thing that will satisfy us totally and satisfy us eternally. Namely, the presence and worth of his own glory. He alone is the source of full and lasting pleasure, end quote. The joy of the Lord, the joy of our God. Wrap this up, verse 10. The Lord commands, the redeemed of the Lord are commanded to go out through the city, prepare its way. Okay, make way, make way for the city to be opened. Remember, these people were in exile. They had just fleed from Babylon, from destruction, from bondage, excuse me, back to Jerusalem. In verse 11 and 12, we'll close here. Chapter 62, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Look what he says. It's not just for Zion. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed where? To the ends of the earth. His reward is with him. He's talking about not the reward of salvation, but what 1 Corinthians teaches us. We'll be judged according to the work that we have done for him and with him. Each one, Paul says, will receive his own reward according to his own labor. We're not talking about salvation. We're not talking about our sin. Look at the relationship. Ben, you guys can come up as we look at these last four names. Look at the relationship, the restored relationship of the Messiah at the very end of chapter 12, uh, uh, chapter 62, verse 12. Let this soak in. You're the holy people. The holy people. God's people are the holy people. Holy means separate. God has called us out of darkness, First uh, excuse me, Colossians 1.13, called us out of the domain of darkness into, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's what it means to be holy. Separated unto God, God does the work, the holy people. The redeemed of the Lord. We've been bought back with the price, the blood of Jesus. We're sought out. We don't seek him, he seeks us. No matter how far they wandered into sin, no matter how far they wandered into exile, no matter how far away they are, God's grace can reach them. Their sins can be forgiven. The holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought out. And look at the last thing he says, a city which has not been forsaken. They have been chastised by God, but they will finally be the ones that will not be forsaken. Family, does this description encourage you this morning? Does this description change our perspective on the future, on the present? It's a good question to ask. What would happen if our hearts... And in our hearts and in our minds, we considered the eternal and glorious provision that is made for the people of God and the central role of the anointed king, Jesus, the Messiah. I think everything would change for us. Andrew Davis reminds us in his commentary how over and over again, Isaiah points to the glorious truth of the salvation for God's people the return of our God, the redemption of the remnant of God, but also, and we see it here, how important it is for us to live on mission. Family, the world needs to hear the gospel. Yes, they need prayer. Yes, they need to, be, to, to demonstrate it with love and care and concern and, and connecting with folks. I, I get that. But they need to hear the truth. That God loves us created us, we ran from him, we've sinned against him, our sins have separated from him, and he's calling everyone everywhere to repent, that means to turn from their sins, and to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place, who bore the wrath we deserve, who was buried and paid the penalty for sin, and then rose victorious from the grave, and it's call on everyone to trust him, have you trusted him, have you been like me, 
sometimes. I get caught up in what's going on, and I'm, I'm losing sight of the eternal reality of that's going to take place. Maybe, maybe you're so wound up and, and stressed out of what's going on and not resting in the providence and the provision of God. Great is our salvation. Great is our salvation. That's our next song. Let us pray. Father, help us, God, to see this world, this, this reality, our circumstance, and all that's going on through the lens of your truth, your word, your promise, your salvation. God, the world will not end what they think it's going to end, but will end when you return, Lord Jesus, to the earth. Reclaim, restore, renew, and redeem you all of your creation. So, Father, help us to have hope in you. And help us, Lord, loosen our tongue for those who seem, those who are living in darkness, those who have no hope, that we would have an opportunity to tell them how great our salvation is and how great you are and be able to talk with them and share with them the good news of the gospel, we pray in Jesus' good name. Amen.